between Maud Island and Vancouver Island, the sheltered coastal sea lane is less than half a mile wide. The tides that race through this bottleneck hide a submerged mountain. Its two peaks, right in the middle of the channel, once threatened every vessel that plied these waters. It was called Ripple Rock. For years, Ripple Rock has been the greatest menace to navigation on Canada's west coast, for it lay in the Inside Passage, a busy shipping lane that extends from Puget Sound to the Gulf of Alaska. A screen of coastal islands shelters this sea lane from the powerful storms of the Pacific. But just 100 miles north of Vancouver lies Seymour Narrows, and in it, Ripple Rock. Even the largest vessel could easily be diverted from its course by the eddies and whirlpools that lashed around the rock. Except for those with intimate knowledge of the Narrows, mariners were advised to enter only at slack water. And when the brief period of slack water came, the rush hour congestion could be dangerous. For Ripple Rock, nine feet below low water, had already caused untold destruction. Over 100 smaller vessels lost. At least 24 large ships lost or severely damaged. Millions of dollars in ships lost. Millions of dollars in time lost, waiting for slack tide. And at least 114 lives known to be lost. Twice, the rock defied attempts to demolish it from the surface. This is the story of how the killer rock finally met its doom. In 1954, the Department of Public Works decided on a new approach to the problem. Dr. Victor Dalmage and Mr. E.E. E. Mason of Vancouver were asked to prepare plans and specifications. Studies by the National Research Council showed that a standard mining method was the best way to approach the rock. This would involve sinking a shaft from Maud Island, drilling a horizontal tunnel below the channel bed out to the center of Ripple Rock, raising a vertical shaft to each of the two pinnacles, and finally a system of small tunnels or coyote drifts for the placing of explosives. Early in 1955, contracts were awarded to two Vancouver companies for the completion of this job. Seymour Narrows was to be the scene of one of the largest man-made blasts in history outside of atomic explosions. Late in 1955, a large permanent camp was established on Quadra Island with cookhouse, recreation hall, office buildings and warehouses, as well as living quarters. Here, a team of 60 men lived for over two years. A head frame was erected over the mine shaft on Maud Island, to the east of Ripple Rock. Naturally, the site attracted a good many interested visitors. <laughs> Miners were working round the clock, about 10 or 12 men going underground for each shift. feet down, the tunnel would run about 2,400 feet altogether to positions under the pinnacles. Only one limited section of 170 feet was timbered in the almost half mile of main tunnel. The rock proved sound and the schedule was maintained. The main tunnel ran 100 feet below the channel bed. Here, two horizontal drill holes explored the rock at least 100 feet ahead of the face at all times. 
and a third inclined hole was drilled at regular intervals. No abnormal water flows were encountered, however, throughout the main tunnel or in the two subshafts, which extended upwards 300 feet to within 40 feet of each summit. A five foot by six foot sublevel ran north and south along the long axis of each rock. These were the service levels. At the bottom of each subshaft was a cage that carried miners up to the sublevel. At every stage of the job, special safety measures protected the miners. In each sublevel, there were steel emergency doors. These would close automatically if the tunnels ever flooded. And at other points, remotely controlled floodgates were installed. In this way, entire sections could be sealed off. And drillers carefully investigated the rock around and above them. The drillers had to provide the engineers with an exact picture of the rock contours. The original examination of the contours, based on echo soundings made in 1944, did not reveal some of the sharper topographical features. From the sublevels, holes were drilled in radial patterns until the sea was reached. Working from known positions, Drillers would drill each hole to break through, a breakthrough to the sea. There she goes. designed rubber plug was attached to the drill steel. It would be rammed up the drill hole to plug it 20 to 30 feet back from the breakthrough. Turning the drill steel tightened a bolt inside the plug, expanding the rubber casing into a tight seal. was repeated at intervals along the sublevels. Working closely with the consulting engineers, the technical experts of the explosives manufacturer now took the most critical step. Specifications called for removal of the rock to a depth of 40 feet. They had to calculate the location of small tunnels or coyote drifts for the placing of explosives, and they had to calculate the quantity of explosives needed. Because this was an underwater blast, 10 times more explosives were required to break up and disperse the rock than would be required for an equivalent burden in air. The total amount of rock to be broken was 368,000 tons. The amount of water to be moved was 317,000 tons. Total amount of explosives, 2,756,000 pounds. This would be blasted in one shot, beginning at the outer edges. Ideally, it would be broken fine and dispersed in the channel on either side of Ripple Rock. A tall order, especially since the whole operation was without precedent. Engineers and surveyors constantly checked to see that the coyote drifts were driven exactly as specified. The four foot by five foot drift had a minimum of 45 feet of rock between them and the sea. Here is where the explosives for the final blast would be stacked.
Miners reached the maze of coyote tunnels through steep access raises leading from the sublevel. The tunnel headings were advanced with great care, just a few feet at a time. time was lost in moving the broken rock away from the headings. Flushers moved the muck with a minimum of handling. At the subshaft, it was dropped 270 feet to the main tunnel. Muck cars then could haul it away. It would be dumped at the skip for hoisting to the surface. International Geophysical Year project. Navy depth charges were dropped in the Ripple Rock area to help seismologists measure the thickness of the Earth's crust and anticipate the degree of vibration set up. In 1958, the shipping of explosives began. Each can of explosives weighed 38 and a half pounds. With 72 cans per pallet, a pallet weighed almost 3,000 pounds. The explosive used was Nitromax 2H, one of the most powerful blasting agents ever developed. Full experts were on hand to supervise the loading. 16 hours a day, the pallets of Nitromax moved down into the working. agent was chosen for its exceptional strength and rock dispersal properties. It would also function normally even if tunnels flooded after loading. And it was safe. This blasting agent would take the roughest of use encountered in transportation and handling. At the bottom of the subshaft, pallets were broken down into half loads. Each half pallet load was numbered and destined to a specific place in the pinnacle. cans each were the maximum which could be lifted by the hoists in the raises and provided a convenient quantity for handling in the cramped confines of the coyote system. The cans were hoisted with a supplementary lift to the highest points of the system. From the high points, the blasting agent could be carried by gravity on sectional skate wheel conveyors. The conveyors, 
extended to the lowest point where loading was started. Sections of conveyor could then be removed as the drifts were loaded. A new position of the conveyor line was required for each stage of loading. Numbers on tunnel walls identified 20-foot sections indicated in the key plan, which also corresponded with colored tags accompanying each half-pallet load. With each change of shift, the spirit of friendly rivalry increased. The ships began to compete with each other to see which could load the greatest quantity into the Coyotes. An average of 64,000 pounds per ship was loaded into the Coyote drift. Special primers, equally resistant to water pressure, were used to detonate the blasting agent. Placed at 20-foot intervals along the system, the primers were connected by cross ties between two continuous lines of Primacord running along the sides of the Coyotes. Primacord is an exploding fuse which detonates at the rate of four miles a second. Knots were tied to convey detonation from the main line of Primacord to the branch line and taped firmly in place. Even the Primacord was specially prepared for this job with an additional coating of waterproofing plastic. Throughout the entire Coyote system, cans were stacked to make a continuous charge, ensuring complete detonation. Lengths of Primacord were threaded into protective plastic piping. This would lead through drill holes from the Coyote systems to each sublevel. could be sent underground for the stemming procedure. To prevent the force of the explosion from backing down the main tunnel, the bags were stacked for a distance of 35 feet on each side of the subshaft. Now came the last major operation, the laying out of the Primacord trunk line. Four continuous lengths of Primacord extended from a central point in each sublevel through the tunnel and up to the shaft collar. Special spools were designed to carry 3,500 foot continuous lengths of Primacord. Two trunk lines were suspended from the roof of the tunnel and two were run along the floor, protected by sandbags. Cross ties were made at 100-foot intervals, so that if any lines were broken by rock falls, all four trunk lines would be re-detonated. As always, there was checking and double-checking before the final word could be given that everything was ready. Timing of the blast was important. The lowest possible tide level was required to reduce the burden of water over the rock, and a fast current flowing away from shore installations to the south to reduce the effects of any tidal wave. Weather and fishing conditions were also considered. Cables to the firing bunker had already been laid. Officials from DuPont of Canada were on hand to have a final look at the installations. Scientists and the engineers responsible for the blast made their last trip underground. A network of seismograph stations was set up throughout the west. The tremor from Ripple Rock, coming at a known time, would help observatory seismologists measure the thickness of the Earth's crust under the mountains. And just before the blast, fish cages were loaded with specimens by marine biologists who hoped to study possible effects of the blast on various species.
highways and air routes within a three-mile radius were blocked by police as a safety precaution. Early on the cloudy morning of April 5th, 1958, a Department of Public Works vessel brings a few engineers and scientists to Quadra Island. This is the day, if the changing weather permits. Only an essential few will see the blast from Quadra, just 2,400 feet from the rock. A thousand feet to the south, official observers arrive at another observation post. Officials from government, scientists, engineers, and reporters. Time signals come from the Dominion Observatory in Ottawa, and the countdown is broadcast by the CBC. Coming up to blast time now, in 30, 29, 28, 27, 26, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, Four, three, two, one, fire. the blast from a position 8,000 feet to the south of Ripple Rock. For scientific and technical purposes, the blast was recorded by several cameras. Now we'll show you another view of the blast from this position, taken through a wide-angle lens. You'll see high-altitude rockets used to measure effects of the air blast. The instant of detonation is signaled by a flash of primacord at the shoreline on the right-hand side. Haze phenomenon is the Wilson condensation cloud. Maximum height of 1,100 feet is reached in seven and a half seconds. Wave action in the open water of Seymour Narrows was dissipated before it reached the shore at 7,000 feet to the south. As predicted by the consultants, ground vibration was well below the damage level. Concussion was so slight that people three miles away were not aware the blast had been fired. Now we'll view the blast from the firing bunker on Quadra Island. 2,400 feet from the rock. On Maud Island, after effects of the blast were studied by the engineers. The considerable turbulence of the waters over the rock subsided in a few minutes. The general performance of the blast was as expected. Maximum lateral dispersal of rock fragments was about 1,500 feet. No damage was done to shaft installations and plant just outside this zone. But the causeway to the camp showed damage from the tidal wave. There was no wave damage to other areas. Within a few hours of the blast, a Department of Public Works vessel was on hand to survey the extent of rock removed. The tremor from the blast was successfully recorded at nearly all the seismograph stations. These recorded to discuss the announcement made by the Honorable Howard Green, Minister of Public Works. 
surveys show the blast was successful. The team of experts had removed the worst menace to navigation on Canada's coastline. Final surveys show a minimum depth of 45 feet over the south pinnacle and 70 feet over the north pinnacle. Now the largest ships can sail right down the center of the narrows in safety. For Ripple Rock now rests in pieces on the bottom of Seymour Narrows.